people in the back, come on, how, are you, how far are you going to spread out here? So um, if you notice that Oracle Boat is in back, did you notice that from yesterday? That's right. So who took it? Nobody here? Okay. Well, if I find out who did, there's a case of beer for you in the back. Um, actually, there's two cases. Do you want blonde or brown? Um, we're going to have a contest. I don't know if you saw it on Twitter, but um, to get a case of beer because we love beer, right? Uh, speaking of beer, I think we need to get Michael one. <laughs> so Michael Kelman, um, he's, uh, he's been a friend of mine for a while here on Cassandra community. He's always on IRC. Um, he has the, the notoriety of being the only guy who went to 120 the day it was released in production. He's the man. Um, so he's going to give us a really, I think, a poignant talk here on um, switching uh, from MySQL to Cassandra. There's a lot of perils, a lot of good stuff. I mean, I, I think this, this is really a good presentation if you're thinking about that or if you have this in your future. So Michael Kelman, take it away. All right, well, uh, I'm here today to talk to you about our, uh, our transition from MySQL to Cassandra. I work for Barracuda Networks, and uh, I'm glad you all made the decision to listen to me blather for the next hour, um, and hopefully I keep you all awake. Uh, so uh, anyways, um, I, if you don't know what Barracuda is, we make real-time, or excuse me, we make uh, network security appliances. We also do uh, cloud solutions. Um, we are moving in towards storage, we've got backup products, um, and we've always been a MySQL house. Um, so uh, fundamentally, we never paid for any database products ever. Um, so Oracle was always, you know, kind of not an option. Um, so uh, we, um, we have a lot of boxes that are single monolithic MySQL, you know, waiting disasters. Um, and I'm sure that there's many people, and uh, I guess the, the point here I wanna make is that I don't want you to think that I stand up here and I'm not gonna be any better than many of you in the audience. Um, I wanna be honest about our problems, about what problems we had and how Cassandra actually made us a better company. Um, so uh, I work primarily in Java, Perl, and C. Um, you can laugh at Perl, it seems to be the, the new thing to do. Um, and I wrote Perl Casa. Um, we have a lot of legacy Perl code and so it's pretty important um, for us to make sure that we can get old um, or older engineers, maybe who still are comfortable in Perl and don't want to learn other languages, um, to be able to work with our new, uh, our new database. Um, I have binary support implemented, but not load balancing yet. Uh, it's committed, and uh, hopefully I'll get that done. I just I couldn't get it done um, between the launch and preparing uh, for this talk. Um, and I do everything. I've worked at Barracuda for six years, um, and so, uh, because of that, I sort of uh, have to touch everything, including uh, you know when the when the box blows up and uh, I have to run to the data center, et cetera. Um, so, anyways, here's our Cassandra cluster. One of the advantages of being an appliance company is that we can actually make our own hardware. Um, so we sort of you know have gone through a lot of iterations on this. We found something that I I think actually works really well. Um, sort of, we've got five different models that we can use depending on the amount of I/O we need and IOPS, et cetera. Um, and it's actually pretty cool what we can do. So this is um, one of our clusters. Um, as you can see, they're all 1U boxes, nothing special. Um, we are running 125, which is the current release, plus patches. Uh, uh, as Patrick said, I, I tend to live on the dangerous side. Um, and uh, we have 24 nodes and two data centers, 12 in each. Um, we have two 2 terabyte hard disks. One time I had some problems uh, back in the day where some nodes accidentally get a little overloaded uh, with capacity during uh, some repair operations, and I almost ran out of disk space. So I pledged I would never run out of disk space again, so I put uh, two terabyte disks um, just for that reason. Um, we have one small SSD for hot comm families. Um, after 1.1, you can now pin hot comm families to an SSD. Um, 64 gigs of RAM. We use Poplar, uh, excuse me, Poplar, <laughs> Puppet for management. Um, and Cobbler, which was a Red Hat project that the Ubuntu guys actually now do in uh, Symfony as well. Um, and it's sort of pixie management. So we can actually take our bare metal um, in our data center and go all the way through remotely um, to bootstrapping into Cassandra um, without me actually being in the data center now, um, which is a, a huge, huge, huge um, you know, change from the way you used to operate uh, operationally with MySQL. And uh, I target load at about 600 gigs a node. So uh, what is real-time? Um, 
I would make the argument that there's no such thing as real time. Um, so you may, uh, you know, obviously there's you know, music processing and stuff like that, but what is your company's definition of real time? How fast do you need to be? Um, and so we had a problem where we weren't real time enough. Um, you know, is it one second, is it five seconds, is it a minute? Uh, in spam case, it actually turns out that for every second, you know, you're gonna have hundreds of messages getting through to your customer that it takes you. Um, and as these attacks get more targeted, um, it's uh, really important that we make our decision faster uh, to protect our customers. Um, so for every second that we lose, um, more spam gets through, the more pissed off, angry customers we have. Um, and so uh, here's a lovely piece of spam. Um, it's got a nice older couple and uh, free diabetes supplies. Um, so when this gets through, um, you know, I feel like I failed um, as an engineer, right? And, and spam's hard, right? Because they're always one step ahead of me, always, our whole team. And after years, you kind of have to accept the fact you're not. But um, you can see there's a fake unsubscribe link at the bottom um, that they want you to click on, which now validates your email. They've got this uh, nice link at the top. So there's a lot of attributes in here that we can figure out uh, if it's good or bad. And um, so, you know, how fast can we take this piece of email? How fast can we determine if it's good or bad? And uh, how fast can we then block it for our customers uh, around the world? And so, um, you know, we had to rewrite. Uh, it got to the point that MySQL uh, was a huge point of pain. And uh, here's some numbers. Um, so we actually decreased our latency to about 2.41. This morning I woke up and we were now averaging uh, under two milliseconds, um, which I think is, is pretty freaking good. Um, and um, we have about 33 million elements in the database. Um, that compares to about four million in MySQL. We actually, um, we started hitting pain points with MySQL around two million. And I wouldn't say that, you know, you can, you can say with MySQL, what's the, the actual number of loads? It's really your write pattern. And uh, unfortunate decisions sort of made our write pattern um, you know, pretty high. And so we did what, what every uh, company does, right? We put a bunch of read slaves. All right, well, now we've got replication lag because we're doing so many inserts per second that, um, you know, that slaves can't catch up. And now, now everything's miserable. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we had problems with insertions, et cetera. And then uh, another important point here, too, is that uh, our old code, because of the way it was, was written, um, we could only serve about 314,000 elements in real time to our customers um, out of the potential 33 million. Um, and um, you know, now we can serve all 33 million to our customers. So that's a pretty strong proposition there as well. Um, tracking, we had all these thresholds built in, and I'm sure that you know, many other people do this as well, um, where you know, maybe we'd have to have 15 uh, appliances in the field ask us about a particular domain or uh, you know, a piece of email before we'd even start looking at it, um, simply because MySQL could not deal um, with the number of transactions if we opened the floodgate to every single you know, possible email. We're in two data centers now, so obviously uh, you know, that's a huge benefit that we can be better to our customers. Um, if we lose a data center, everyone knows here you're going to lose a data center, it's just when. Um, and then, this is the huge one, we went from eight minutes on average from classifying a domain um, to three seconds. So we take an action now in three seconds. Um, and so uh, this is actually an article that Jonathan Ellis tweeted, um, how to survive a ground up rewrite without losing your sanity. Um, it's by Joel, he founded uh, Stack Overflow, our co-founder, and um, he was also at Microsoft. Um, and I really recommend reading this article, it was an article I wish I had read before I started writing. Um, and pretty much the, the proposition was they had two rewrites they were doing. They were a .NET MS SQL um, house. And one of the uh, rewrites went really well, but there was a business proposition. Um, sales had actually turned around to them and said, hey, look, you know, if they're over this number of transactions per second, they did sort of a new relic type thing with the application monitoring. Um, if they were, you know, if their application was doing n number of transactions, you can't sell to them because it's actually gonna bring down the entire system for everyone. And so they couldn't sell anymore. And so they actually had to rewrite that. They were saying that, you know, just to put out new MS SQL clusters, they would need to rewrite code and they need to push it so then regressions were coming in. And uh, the other one, engineering thought that they had to rewrite. The code, you know, was, you know, you looked back on and you said, hey, what the heck were we thinking? Um, the one where engineering did it, that one failed. The features that everyone said that they, you know, absolutely didn't need, all of a sudden now needed to be implemented yesterday. 
Um, and the other one, now they were able to sell and their product was a lot better. Um, and so, you know, past engineering decisions, um, they may have been right at the time, and I don't want to bash on MySQL and I don't want to bash on the decisions of it. Um, it's just now with the data load that we have and the world that we live in, you need to be a little more agile. And uh, in our particular case, right, threats are becoming a lot smarter, they're becoming more targeted, right? And, and more importantly, too, people I think are a little less willing to get that false positive, right? I'm sure everyone in here, even in Gmail, it happened, it was funny, I was sending these slides for someone to take a look at, and they had hosted Gmail, and it ended up in their spam folder. <laughs> so uh, I was like, oh, thanks for, you know, not looking at my slides. But um, it went to their spam folder, right? So similar case with us, right? You don't want that piece of message to get in. So how are we accurate as close to 100% of the time without letting spam through? And so uh, obviously um, it comes to legacy systems, right? Everyone can write sloppy code. I guess show of hands, who's never written a bug? Right? That's what I thought, right? Who in here thinks that, you know, has looked at their code and never said, uh, wow, like why the heck did I write that? Well, come work for me then, please. <laughs> um, you know, I look at some code even six months after and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, why the heck did I, you know, did I do that? And obviously there was a reason at the time, but uh, I think everyone, because of time constraints, getting the project out, you just, you need to ship it, you start sort of making compromises that may not be great for engineering um, in the long run. And so you start putting all this duct tape around the database, right? You start throwing memcache in, you maybe put Redis, whatever the, the cache of the month is, right? And uh, you try to make your application perform to this part, but you, you know, fundamentally your database is now limiting your application. And so you need to hit the reset button, right? So nowadays, can you imagine five years ago, someone standing up here saying that you should hope that your nodes in your database are failing constantly? Absolutely not, right? And uh, so instead, you know, you can engineer these things with these cheap little boxes that you hope constantly are failing, but you're resilient enough that you can keep adding them in, right? You can scale, you can replace them really easily. You know, you don't have to get woken up at 4 a.m. because your, your, your database went down. Um, it's easily scalable. There's no single point of failure, and I, I say that you know of, right? Because there's always that single point of failure that brings everything down. Um, and then, uh, obviously, many smaller boxes versus one monolithic box. So, um, we had a, uh, an interesting case where we said, hey, look, you know, MySQL is not going to cut it for us anymore. We need to rewrite. And um, we went to the product guy and we had to get buy-in. And we had to get technical buy-in from a lot of people who really liked MySQL. Um, you know, who they, they thought it was the best database product. And um, unfortunately, they wouldn't let us go architect the, funder, you know, the underlying um, solution without you know, producing. So they wanted something produced every three months. And so um, this actually created something interesting um, for us is that we needed to come up with these intermediary stages um, of, of giving actual production quality results um, to other teams um, as, as we do, you know, backend data. Um, and so I guess this is in the presentation where I now put up this really cool cacti graph um, showing how awesome our latency is now. Um, I conveniently took this, though, on a Saturday, and I took a 12-hour period, and um, this is really what happened, right? And um, I guess this is the, to point out that Cassandra is not a MySQL replacement, and uh, direct replacement, excuse me, and it's not a magic bullet to solve everything, right? So in, uh, in V1 here, um, that was me uh, having a crappy threading model on our logging, um, and uh, I pushed the code much to my... Uh, my boss's dismay probably three times, you can see, in a very short amount of time to all of our nodes. Um, V2, I didn't realize that um, there was a uh, data center aware load balancing policy in the new Datastax Java driver for Cassandra. And so what had happened was we were actually making half of our requests across data centers, um, which was uh, you know, clearly increasing the overall latency in our, in our application. And so then V3, you can see here, um, that magically now our latency numbers are down around 2.41 milliseconds. Um, I have no idea what happened at that spike right there. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I got an email saying that they saw some weird network connectivity during the same time, so you know, maybe I can blame it on the network, guys. Um, so migrating is painful, it's really painful. I hope I have mentioned it's painful. There's tons of regressions uh, and there's tons of rewriting. So why should you do it? Cassandra is the best option for your persistence tier right now, bar none. 
If you can come up with a better option right now, I would love to talk and chat with you uh, afterwards, right? It comes down to how, as a business, are you going to bring your company to the next phase, right? And uh, for us, MySQL wasn't gonna bring us there, right? We couldn't shard um, our data set very easily. Uh, read slaves weren't gonna work, and if you were crazy enough to go master, master, um, that wasn't something um, that was even going to fix the problem, it was just gonna delay the inevitable. Um, and so don't let your database hold you back, right? You've got a great option, why are you stuck, right? So, lessons learned, the good. Um, we spent a lot of time, my boss and I, in fact, we actually did it four times because we didn't take notes and we kept forgetting, so we would sit down and we would do it again. Um, what is our data model gonna look like? How are we going to, you know, make this thing so that four years down the line I don't have to then stand here again and say, what the heck was I thinking, right? Um, and uh, I think we did a really good job. Um, we found a way to really denormalize our data. Um, it's working really well. And more importantly, because we had those targets we had to go every three months, we were able to really, you know, scale our data and, and change the way that we were going to, to include stuff. So um, measure twice, cut once. So just because it's uh, no SQL, uh, as everyone likes to call it, or big data, right, that doesn't mean you don't have to take all of the precautions that we all were taught to take. Um, the bad. Um, we did not consider migration and delivery and how we were going to deliver to our legacy customers um, from the very beginning. And um, that was sort of a mistake um, because um, I think that's where we made our biggest, our biggest um, sort of uh, gaps along the way. I'll, I'll get into them in a little bit. Um, adjust expectations. Um, we, we hit the point where we knew we weren't going to, to be able to continue with MySQL. Um, sort of, I would say, a year after we knew we, we couldn't, you know, when the first signs um, started to hit. And um, I didn't expect to need to rely on our legacy systems for as long as they did. And um, so then you've got this year gap, right, where you're like, hey, look, I've already committed all this code into Trunk, and it's super awesome, and it does what you want. But at the end of the day, tech support's still getting all these calls and saying, you know, hey, this, piece, you know, this is wrong, or this is, you know, X, Y, Z. And um, so you really need to manage those, and you also need to think about yourself as an engineer. How are you going to make minor improvements to your legacy system, right? You can't just let it die, um, because you've got hundreds of thousands of customers still using that. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, and then syncing, you gotta take that really seriously. Um, because, um, you know, you can write the best code in the world, but if you migrate your data and you do a really crappy job syncing, um, you know, now your code sucks as well. So I've got uh, eight tips here. Uh, one, define your requirements early. Two, start with queries. Three, think differently regarding reads. Four, syncing and migrating data. Five, don't use Cassandra as a queue. Six, estimate capacity. Seven, automate, 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 and eight, some maintenance required. So one, what kind of queries will your application make? Um, I think this is important. Um, if you think that you can just take your exact data structure from MySQL and drop it into Cassandra, you're gonna be in a world of hurt, right? And your graphs, uh, you know, probably are not gonna look great. Um, because as I said, it's not the magic bullet, and if you don't take that into account, um, you know, life's gonna be fairly miserable for you. Um, do you need ordered results? We have sort of this weird uh, requirement where we need real-time ordered results of all of the rows in all of our column families. Um, this actually presents a pretty big problem for a distributed system because now you've got keys all over the place um, and they're in random order. So how do we do that? Um, I'll actually come to our solution. And then what is your read load and write load, right? You should get real numbers because I guarantee probably everyone in here thinks that their write load and read load, unless you have real numbers, is different than it actually is. So if you don't have real numbers, how are you gonna plan correctly um, when you deploy your Cassandra cluster? So two, start with the queries. Um, Cassandra doesn't mean that you can just ignore uh, your queries. And I think uh, CQL is actually good because I think it sort of forces and brings back that mentality of I need to think about, hey, this architecture and this distributed, how am I gonna make it work, right? Um, counters and composites. So counters are cool, but they're a rough guesstimate. Um, so, you know, there's a couple of tickets that you can look at um, for counters. Uh, composites are your friend. So in CQL, that would be primary keys. But how are you gonna partition your data? Um, that's really important to think about. 
and uh, optimize for your use case. So don't be afraid of writes, right? Disk space is really cheap, um, and uh, memory is pretty cheap, nodes are pretty cheap right now. So if you can make multiple writes all over the place, um, and then you know, collect that and do one read, um, you know, your life's gonna be a lot better than now trying to think about, oh, well, you know, I can't store this data twice because I can't do writes, and now I gotta update this index because it's MySQL, right? If you get rid of that mentality um, that we've been trained to, to try to optimize, your life's gonna be a lot better. And then uh, finally, reduce the number of tombstones, right? And so you may have heard yesterday at some of the talks about tombstones. Um, SS tables are immutable. So when they get written, they're append, on, append only. Um, so when the delete happens, right, a flag gets written in there saying, hey, look, you know, we actually want to delete this. And then you've got GC grace period, which happens. And you don't actually remove that data until GC grace is expired, right? So if you're making all of these deletes all over the place, and then you're also not doing any maintenance, now you've got all of that data still on disk. And it's sort of like the Postgres problem, right? And so it's not like, uh, you know, there aren't solutions there, but you need to be aware of that. And you should think about um, maybe you don't need to delete that data. Oops, I don't know what I just did, sorry. Um, three, think differently regarding reads. Um, I think because MySQL's performance is less than stellar many times, we have um, sort of, or I did, gone into the mentality of I need all of the data now and then put it somewhere fast. And um, this is pretty poor use case for Cassandra. And in fact, because you've now fixed your read and write problem, um, you don't need to do this, right? So if you do select star from a really big column family where foo equals bar, um, around 10,000 rows you will get an RPC timeout. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact is it has to iterate over every single, you know, place all over the place. And, you know, maybe there's further optimizations that could be made later. Um, but do you really need all 32 million, 33 million rows at the exact same time, right? And then if you've got wide rows, now you're talking a ton of columns. Um, and so what we did for this is we're using Elasticsearch, um, which is a distributed Lucene, um, and that's how we're getting our real-time sorted order that we need. Um, and then we have Hadoop and Pig that we're using as well for times that we need to actually iterate over every single key in a particular column family. So thinking of migrating data, um, I will give you know, a few battle stories here. Um, the first one, I wrote our first sync script and I thought everything was great and um, we went to production for our new web filter categories. And uh, it turned out I had blocked ups.com, I blocked uh, German Google, um, and on the day of the Samsung 4 release, I blocked samsung.com. Um, so uh, pretty much we had a lot of really upset customers. Um, and it turned out that, um, a few years ago, some of the timestamps for where we had, class when we had marked when we had classified a particular uh, domain, we had uh, put them in as zero. And my sync script was looking for greater than zero because why the heck would I have an epoch back in 1970? Um, so anyways, that was a, a stupid greater than or equal. And uh, you know, I fixed it real fast, but it was a pretty painful day and, and one that I will always remember. Um, so we've had a couple other things too, like um, you know, priority of your sync. I would argue that you may have different data that should get to your new system faster, right? There's the, you know, the whole enchilada script. Um, and so what we've actually done is written four sync scripts that we run at all times. We've got the one that's really super fast that runs and we just immediately dump stuff over. Um, we've got the one that takes a million hours because you've got to go through all the stuff that's constantly changing. Um, and uh, so really think about your, your sync script um, and take it as seriously as any production code you put in. Because a mistake here, um, you know, everyone has to migrate their data. And in our case too, we were taking stuff from flat files, we were taking stuff from other MySQL database, we were, we were taking stuff from all different sources. And uh, inevitably you will make a mistake. So how do you, you know, sort of um, take all of those different pieces together and then run them o over and over again? Oops, wrong button again. Um, don't use Cassandra as a queue. Um, so it's, uh, it's really easy to want to do this use case. Um, and so there's a, a, a nice blog article, it's linked at the bottom from Datastax um, that Aleski wrote on um, Cassandra, Cassandra anti-patterns. Um, and so I just talked about tombstones and read performance, right? So um, it makes sense you'd want this distributed durable queue. Um, it turns out it's not the best use case. Um, there's plenty of other great use cases for Cassandra, so don't use it for this one. 
Um, you know, you can, you can use your cool new cluster for many, many, many other things. And so instead what we did is we're using Kafka. Uh, it's a multi-pub, multi-consumer, durable queue. Uh, it came out of LinkedIn. When you get that little email that says, you know, that these many people saw your profile and do you want to sign up for pro and stuff, um, that I believe still goes through Kafka. Uh, and it's, it's pretty awesome. 0.8 is a, is a really cool release. Um, and so our combination of using Cassandra with Kafka is working awesome. I mean, really, 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 really well. Um, and uh, you know, you throw Elasticsearch in there, and I, I, you know, I'm having a, uh, a really great day as an engineer. Um, six, estimate capacity. So don't forget about the Java heap, right? So uh, you want about eight gigs max. Um, and if you go any higher than that, you're probably going to run into GC pause issues. So that being said, we have 64 gigs of, uh, of RAM on these boxes. Um, you know, how do we use that? Well, there's obviously a lot of things that are off heap. There's off heap caching, key caching, row caching. So you can still use that. And then also remember too that, you know, the kernel, the Linux kernel is pretty smart about caching. So you can let the Linux kernel sort of do part of the job as well. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, there's no reason not to allow that. Um, plan for capacity. Um, don't let your nodes get to the point that they're at 1.2 terabytes of load. Um, because then you're going to need to bootstrap a new node, and you're going to, you know, bring that in, and then you're still going to need to do a cleanup operation. And you're still going to need to move tokens, et cetera, uh, unless you know you can double the size, or you know, I guess with V nodes, it's not as, as big a deal anymore. Um, and so, uh, stay ahead of it. Um, I guess is the the main lesson here. There were plenty of times where I let it get too big, uh, and I, I strongly regretted, and that's why I probably started balding uh, at my young age. <laughs> um, stress tool. Um, you can use this. Um, it comes with Cassandra, vanilla Cassandra, and run it against your nodes, right? Get one node, get a piece of hardware config that you're really happy with, and figure out how many writes and reads can you do. And then obviously multiply that and figure out what your replication factor is going to be and how many data centers do you want. And then you can pretty easily get a, you know, good idea for what your capacity should be. Um, but the idea that, oh, well, Cassandra is super powerful and um, I don't need to ever worry about I.O. anymore um, is, is kind of um, going to hurt you. So uh, I.O. is just as important. So use the stress tool, figure it out, right? And then, uh, and, and if you plan ahead of time, things should be probably a lot better for you in the long run. Uh, MySQL hardware is not Cassandra hardware. So if you've got a really big node, uh, we have some of my SQL boxes. They're uh, RAID 60, 16 drive boxes that uh, have 256 gigs of RAM and 32 cores, and um, they're pretty cool boxes, right? But um, that's probably going to be a little overkill considering, you know, you can only still use 8 gigs max on um, the heap. So if you get lots of small boxes um, that are cheap, you know, you can probably get three boxes for maybe the cost of that one massive box. And now you've also built in some redundancy, right? You can kill one or two or one of those nodes and you haven't lost any data, right? Um, and uh, hopefully, too, if you've planned your capacity, your performance of your application hasn't gone down. And then another one, too, because Cassandra is so awesome, um, did your old code and your other prior architecture decisions that you've brought over, is that now going to become a bottleneck? Um, so in our case, we did find, you know, some code that was less than optimal. And uh, how do we now have to think about, you know, do we need to rewrite that? Is this going to become a bottleneck for our, our decisions? Automate, automate, automate. There was a guy uh, around Christmas on IRC who had upgraded his 30-something node cluster. And he did it manually because he thought that automating it would, um, he'd make a mistake with the automation. And uh, what ended up happening was on two of his nodes, he accidentally didn't put the config in. He put the stock config. And so they had come up in test cluster, and he had lost data. And he, we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on how he could not have ever made a mistake and that, you know, Cassandra has this bug that's put it in test cluster. And, and guess what? Like, I make mistakes. We all make mistakes. It's human nature. Automate it. The problem won't happen, right? There's this really cool tool that Sylvian wrote called CCM, right? You can make an Insta cluster on your MacBook Pro, right? So you stick it there, you've got three, and then you run your puppet config on it, and boom, oh, hey, look, you know, I magically, and now I'm on one, two, right? And you know, you're gonna make mistakes in your automation, but more importantly, now you've figured out what those mistakes are ahead of time. Um, I, you know, I, I cannot stress this enough. We came from a company that maybe didn't automate enough, 
Um, we are now really trying to automate everything. Everything we do is through Puppet. Everything is repeatable. And, and the more important thing is, right, if you've now got this really big distributed system, right, you've now moved all of that complexity to operations. So if you didn't plan for your operations and people don't understand that, now when that node does die, you know, how are you going to deal with that failure? You still have to. So, you know, if you're going to buy into this idea of continuous failure, you need to make sure that you've taken care of it from an ops side. Um, so, you know, if you want to use rsync and chip around tarballs of your config, that's fine. If you want to use chef, that's fine. We use Puppet. Um, but, um, you know, the earlier you do this and the earlier that you're able to, to you know, make this, um, th this is a big regret of mine is that we didn't do it fast enough. And in fact, I still have two nodes in our cluster that we did a, an apt get install on. And so now they're this sort of Frankenstein where I'm manually patching jars on them as I make builds. Um, and I, I still need to rebuild them. Um, but, uh, you know, everything else is, is automated in this, those two nodes. Um, I've actually still screwed them up because once again, they're manual. So, um, you know, I wish I had never apt get installed those two nodes. <laughs> um, and then um, we actually did a cool thing uh, my coworker Shital wrote, which creates a CCM cluster on um, your dev box, and it goes out to our production cluster and it grabs n number of keys from all the column families and makes them locally. So you can deal with actual data that's coming in. You may, you may not have the read and write load, right? But you can deal with real data from that day on your production code. Um, so, uh, you know, you don't need to operate on your production cluster, you know, you just run this command and boom, there's a three node CCM cluster with real data on it. Um, so that was actually something I wish we'd done earlier and it's, uh, it's you know, really cool from a dev environment. You know, you can run Hadoop against it, we can do builds of Hadoop, we can, we can check all that stuff and um, not worry about needing to, um, you know, ruin our production cluster. Eight, some maintenance required. Um, I was not a Java developer before starting with Cassandra. Um, so I have obviously went to school and, you know, you get taught Java and you go through all that. Um, but Barracuda is not a Java company. I guess maybe we are a bit now. Um, but um, I did not know what JConsole was. I didn't know what JMap was. I didn't know what JStack was. Um, and I'm willing to fully admit that I didn't know what all this stuff in the JDK did. Um, I just knew that Java was required and you run this jar. Um, so. I think if you want to run Cassandra, you need to know a little something about Java development. Um, why is there an eight gig heap, right? If you don't understand which garbage collection is, et cetera, and like why you're hitting these limits and do you have a healthy um, a garbage collection going on, um, I think it's gonna bite you because it bit me um, because I was sort of uh, trying to take Linux mentality, right? If you S trace a Java process, I don't know if anyone's done that in here, you're just gonna see a bunch of a um, few texts and stuff going by, and it means nothing. Um, so that's why these tools were written. It's not like they, you know, wanted to make a pretty picture. It's you have to use them for Java development, right? And um, so what we ended up doing was um, Jukala. It's, um, it's a free client you can get. You can hook it in, and you can do HTTP requests um, to JMX. And so it's cool, because then you can write a script in whatever your favorite language is, um, and now you can automate um, you know, all these actions. Um, almost every important thing in Cassandra is in JMX. Um, JConsole is sort of a cool way to do that. You can see all the mbeans um, that are, are in Cassandra and you can go through them. Um, so uh, I actually have a, a little bash alias I made. I just do JC space and then a node and then it just magically comes up with JConsole for that Cassandra node. Um, that was one of the better things I did. Um, Repairs. So I was sitting in a talk, uh, Jason Brown's talk yesterday, and uh, he was talking about um, sort of consistency and repairs, et cetera, on Cassandra from a technical level. And uh, there was tons of questions about, well, my cluster is doubling when I run repair, and then I've got to run this and that. And, and uh, I think it's a pain point because, you know, everyone's run into some type of repair problem. Um, but, um, you know, if you sort of figure out and you can use these tools, you can start figuring out you know, why this is happening. Um, so when the Merkle tree gets calculated, right, if any one mutation didn't get applied, now that, that checksum that um, is not gonna match. So as soon as that one doesn't happen, now it's gonna stream all of that data and then the node goes through that data and figures out what, you know, is missing. And so if you don't run a repair ever, maybe you, you, you have never run a repair for a year and then you go through and you do, you know, that first repair, 
there could potentially be tons of ranges that are out of sync. And it's probably gonna take a really long time. Um, but uh, uh, another, another battle story um, that I guess I wasn't gonna tell, but it's a good one. So the first time um, that I decided to add, we were gonna double our cluster from three to six nodes. Um, and I was super pumped. And uh, um, I went to do the move operation and I, I fired up a screen session on all three nodes, uh, or all six nodes, six nodes actually, and I ran uh, node tool move and then the token that they were gonna go to, and I went to bed. Um, <laughs> and I woke up and things were really bad, right? Because what is a move doing? It's actually literally moving data that needs to be on other nodes to redistribute the ring, right? It's not like this magical process that all of a sudden uh, has happened, and I, I guess I didn't, I didn't think about what was happening. Um, and so anyways, I was in a complete world of hurt, right? I've got data that shouldn't be on nodes here and here and all over the place, and, um, and it, it was probably about two weeks to get our cluster stable again. Um, and so uh, now I understand, right, when you do this maintenance, you're moving a lot of data, right? If you've got terabytes of data on your cluster, and you have to move them, and you're, you have to do repair, you're going through a lot of data. And then, you know, if you use these slightly underpowered or low IO, you know, IO nodes with the idea you're gonna distribute them, you, then you put 1.2 terabytes of data on them like I did, now you've gotta go through 1.2 terabytes of data. Like, it, you know, and you're not magically gonna get more SSDs. You, know, you can't imagine you've got a 16, you know, RAID 10 array of SSDs in this box that's got two spinning disks, right? And so I guess once I came to grips to the fact that yes, IO and Java is the same, um, things started getting better, right? Because then I realized that it's, it's not Cassandra's fault, it's the fact that I didn't think about what these operations are doing and how much data I'm moving, right? And so if you stay on top of it, if you do um, what I'm now doing is a rolling repair, so I actually use Jukala with a script that I retrieve all of the nodes at that point, and I pretty much always have a node repairing. Um, and it just goes around the cluster and it does a node tool um, repair dash PR. Um, and so it just does one on every single one. And then when I finish that, I then do a cleanup on every single one. And I find that that actually doesn't uh, hurt our uh, performance of our cluster. Um, where is Barracuda today? So we are two years in production with Cassandra. Um, I still love it. Um, and after two years, I think that maybe I've, I've gone through the, the hate phase and I, I still love it. Um, it was definitely our, the right choice for us. Um, the numbers speak for themselves at this point. Um, and uh, I have zero regrets for making the decision. Um, and I think it's probably one of the most important things I've ever done uh, in my life. Uh, we have two product lines that are 100% now powered, their data is powered by Cassandra. Um, our spam firewall is um, in beta for anyone to, to join and hopefully next week um, it will be going to every single one of our customers. Um, and more importantly, anecdotally, uh, I talk to people who I've switched over to the new code, and they actually tell me, yes, my spam is better. And so that's really what's important. I could talk about how many transactions per second that we could do, and I talk about how fast our you know, response time is, et cetera. But more importantly, there's the human aspect of the fact that people like my product better. Um, and I think that that is directly um, related to Cassandra. Um, and uh, we have achieved real-time response. I think three seconds from the first time we've ever seen a particular domain in the field to classifying or to making an initial decision is really good. Um, so 2.0 and beyond. Um, I think there's uh, you know, a lot of developers who wrote in Thrift and they sort of got used to the API and now there's this, oh, well now I gotta go learn SQL. Uh, or CQL. Um, you know, there's really, CQL is just a better protocol. Thrift is not a great protocol. Um, I know that there's some people who are outspoken in the community who probably will hate me for this, for saying it, and I'll be on their blacklist. But, you know, the team has really done an awesome job with CQL. It's great, it's awesome. And importantly, we've got engineers who don't understand what a slice predicate and what, you know, a, a get multi-range is, right, and all of this stuff, and what my start and stop is, they, they don't, and, and more importantly, I think they don't want to necessarily have to learn that. They just want the power of Cassandra. And so everyone understands select star from table. Everyone gets it. And so if you can now you know, spend all that time up front making a really great data structure and really making sure that you're, you know, you've thought that through, and now you can sort of give that to people to now tap into that power, that's pretty powerful, right? 
And, um, and that's why I think it's awesome. And you, know, you can say, or the 10 Gen CEO can say what he wants um, about how he's now won because of CQL. Um, that's really powerful. It's great. And so um, I'm, I'm pretty pumped um, for the direction of the database. And, and the fact that now I can go to people and say, hey, look, you know, we've got this really great tool that's going to make your code better. Um, CAS, which uh, Jonathan briefly spoke about, um, and other 2.0 features, um, I think two are going to continue to make Cassandra the best solution. And so that brings me to the Cassandra community. So there's obviously a lot of other competitors in this space. There's a lot of commercial competitors. Um, React, HBase, Oracle. Um, I was told to remove uh, by a friend the M database because it was a cheap shot. Um, so uh, the bigger question is how's their development community? Uh, you cannot beat the developer community in Cassandra, right? There are so many dedicated people, I mean, you can see them here, who just love working on this stuff. They live and breathe it. Um, I can't personally say the same about the others. Um, but if you've got something that performs really well, that's going to make your application great, and you've got a lot of awesome success stories, how can you go wrong, right? And uh, so there's obviously IRC channel. Um, I had never used IRC uh, as well before. Uh, well, I'd used it like once or twice, but nothing seriously. Um, so I guess it's maybe a little bit intimidating at first to figure out what the free node uh, servers are and stuff and how to log on, but it's worth it. It takes uh, you know, five minutes, you can figure it out. And then uh, you're at, you can just get access to this wealth of people who want to help you, um, who are just doing it you know, out of the kindness of their heart. And then obviously there's the mailing list, um, user at cassandra.apache.org. There's tons of awesome information on there. Um, and uh, I would really recommend that you take that as well. So um, that's all I have. Um, I've got obviously some time for question and answers if, you, uh, if anyone has any. Uh, I think she's got the microphone. Um, data quality. Did you encounter any data quality issues in your migration? Um, that was not mentioned in your top eight, and kind of curious of why. Data quality is in the syncing that I was talking about in our- Well, as in just the business data, as in just the, the data that you're moving from MSQL to- uh, You mean consistency, actually, of the migrated data? So that's what I was talking about with the sync script. So where I screwed up and assumed that the epoch would never be zero, Right? That was a pretty big mistake on my part. Um, but obviously there's, there's other examples too. And so that's why I bring up the syncing, right? Because as you said, data quality, we were taking stuff from tons of sources. Like one huge thing we got out of Cassandra, um, that hopefully I made clear, was now all of our data is in one place. So we can now do really cool stuff with it. Um, with MySQL, it's this constant battle of, well, it's not gonna fit in here, we can't put it here, oh, we're gonna export and delete this data in these rows here, and this constant juggling. Um, so certainly we did, uh, and that's why I say take your sync script as seriously as your production code. Um, because um, certainly, like, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a bug on my end on the actual code, it was a bug in the sync script, and then that led to me blocking G uh, German Google, um, you know, which leads to really unhappy people. All right. Thank you. Yep. So uh, what type of backup strategies do you have in disaster recovery? Um, so um, we don't, re so there's obviously snapshots in Cassandra. Um, we're not actively like doing backup to tape or anything like that. We have replication factor three. Um, I'm doing constant repairs. Um, our really important data, we write it at Quorum. Um, and we are, we're at two uh, data centers as well. Um, so uh, we can fully, our, our application can fully service our entire customer base from one or other um, the, of the uh, data centers. So you're not backing it up to S3, you're doing, are, are you using the snapshot feature? Um, yes, but I wouldn't say it's like a consistent thing. I'm, I'm not doing like, you know, the, the equivalent of a MySQL dump or a Percona backup every night. Um, but the, I think the consistency features, um, and uh, you know the fact we're in two data centers is, is probably good enough for us. Okay. Yep. Do the uh, vNode or off-heap uh, memory 
management features that are in Cassandra and coming in 2.0, uh, th these things, would those change your uh, recommendation about using lots of small servers? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, you know, the number of nodes that you have on a V node is, is the same. And, um, you know, the, the initial bootstrapping with uh, V nodes, it's, it's, you still have to move all that data, as I said, right? So, um, you know, it just makes certain things better um, and spaces out the data across the ring. I, I'm actually thinking um, about Netflix's experience with moving to uh, beefier high I.O. instances in uh, EC2 versus a lot of smaller instances, if, if that would make a difference. Uh, well, so I think EC2 is a, a bit different than, um, I mean, we make our own hardware, so I can benchmark it. I think you sort of get whatever was installed with Amazon, you're not really sure. Um, and we don't run in EC2, so I'm not really sort of the best person to talk about that. But I do know IO is a pretty big concern for Amazon customers. Um, so, you know, they may have just needed to go to a beefier instance on Amazon to get the performance that they felt was necessary. Um, they're also dealing with, um, you know, million writes a second on one of their clusters, right? So they're dealing with data. And, and I guess this is one important point I didn't make that I meant to make. Um, you don't have to have a, quote, big data problem to feel like you shouldn't use Cassandra, right? So, you know, we weren't doing a million transactions per second but Cassandra has made our app so much better, right? And so you don't need, um, you don't need to have a million transactions per second to get a lot out of Cassandra. Um, and so you need to just sort of figure out how much are you willing to pay. If your company is willing to pay for, you know, n number of nodes or 24 nodes with, um, you know, 16 SSDs, um, go for it. I mean, that's awesome. Um, but in our case, we had to figure out what's the cost-benefit um, ratio that we want um, to get the redundancy that we want, the, the uh, performance that we want per node, and obviously the ability to have nodes die and still uh, perform. Does that answer your question? I think there's a question back there. Right now, we are planning to migrate from SQL Server to Cassandra. A lot of business users are like really comfortable doing ad hoc queries. And we build our primary indexes and all those things. And then a bunch of business customers come and head to give me a bunch of reports. We just go and write some ad hoc queries, give a report. How do you convince your business customers when you migrate to Cassandra if you want to? create some ad hoc reports, what kind of ecosystem do you guys use? Do you guys run into those kind of problems? Um, so I, I'm not, I, I think I understand your question, so let me phrase it so I make sure I get it, that your internal customers yeah. need reports on your data, and exactly. do we have that problem? Um, so uh, as I said, if there is the use case where you need to iterate through every single piece of your data, that's where we bring in Pig and Hadoop. Um, so you can write a pig script, you can get all your data out in the format you need, and then you can format it back into your reports. Um, so those tools are there. Um, I'm not sure what else. Uh, I'm not sh is there something else you're looking for in that answer? Yeah, primarily what kind of ecosystem do you guys use? You said pig and hive. And Hadoop. We don't use hive. Um, we don't use hive. Pig and Hadoop. We use pig and Hadoop, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Is anyone awake? <laughs> There's uh, one up here and one over there. So if you don't want to store a terabyte on each node, um, what is the sort of soft limit you're using? Is it like 50 gigs or 100 gigs? What is the... So you said you don't want to manage a terabyte on a Cassandra node because of the various repair problems with copying all the data. So how much data do you limit it to? Um, so as I mentioned, 600 gigs per node is the max that I'm personally comfortable with. Um, over there.
So this is more of a political question. Um, did you encounter some resistance to moving to this new technology and how did you uh, get through those hurdles? Yeah, totally. So um, that was um, something uh, maybe I didn't make clear enough um, with the technical buy-in, um, certainly. So we were a MySQL shop, as I said. Um, and uh, I don't want to just keep bashing on MySQL. I think that there is a, there's a point in place and there's um, a reason that MySQL is what it is. Um, and so I think that having that conversation internally, especially to what we did, we got, or unbeknownst to me, um, someone was assigned as the uh, MySQL advocate. So when I did the initial pitch uh, as a team to the rest of our, uh, of our engineering leadership, um, the guy pretty much did every single thing he could to make sure that we would stay with MySQL. Well, you can do this, well, you can do this, well, you can do this, well, you can do this. And uh, it was really good because it actually did bring up a few things that um, were easily work, you know, we came up with technical solutions to, but maybe weren't things I, I thought about. Um, so uh, I would actually advocate for that, you know, get an advocate, an advocate for, for MySQL or Postgres or whatever you're moving from um, and have them go in there and sort of say, well, you can do this, you can do this. And if you can't come up for great answers for all this stuff, you know, maybe you don't have a real business decision or, or reason or logic to actually move, right? I mean, as I said, it's painful, right? I, I'm, I'm personally upset that I made mistakes with that sink, right? Because it inconvenienced our customers and that's, that's pretty bummer, right? And so, but that's gonna happen if you're, you're moving all this data. And so, um, and as I said too, we couldn't go away and just do the architecture and then come back and say, okay, now we're ready to go. And it turned out because we were pulling all the data from all these separate places, you know, that was what we had to do. We had to implement the bottom. But we had to come up with sort of different little, you know, hurdles along the way that we would go, okay, here's something. Here's proof that this is gonna work. Um, and so I think it too, if you think that you can just go away for a year, um, you're probably not gonna get the, the business buy-in either. Do you have a follow-up? Oh, she, she's got the, the mic. So I, I would think one key to the success here was that you did things in parallel with MySQL. Totally, yeah. And so then, we're, we're running both systems 100% in production. In the talk yesterday, the guy said one way to get a new technology into you know, corporate America is like a pilot program, don't completely replace something, but you know, show it to be better for certain applications. And, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I think naively I thought that it was going to be possible that one day I would just, you know, switch off MySQL and, um, and move all of the associated infrastructure over. It's not going to happen. Um, and uh, so totally, you know, prove that, yes, this is a great solution for us. Prove that, hey, look, I'm able to produce, you know, business driving, um, you know, stuff for my company. And then you could sort of add from there, um, you know. Very so, good, yeah. Anyone else? So you'd mentioned uh, avoiding over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Way in the back. <laughs> uh, you'd mentioned avoiding reading lots of rows by processing data using Hadoop. Yep. Um, how did you actually get the data from Cassandra into Hadoop? Um, so there's, um, there's Hadoop classes in Cassandra. So there's column family input reader. There's um, a CQL um, compatibility coming in 1.6. Um, 1, 2, 6, excuse me. Um, and, um, and so there's examples in the examples folder at the root of the project um, that you can take a look at on how to use um, uh, Cassandra as both an input and output um, for Hadoop. Anyone else? Have I bored you all to death? No? Going once? Going twice? All right, thank you.